Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Mining News. I've got a cold this week, so bear with me if I'm pretty low energy. Let's just get right into the news stories. Last week, I talked about the MC2 SIO SD card adapter for the PS2, the video that Macho Nacho made. I actually was able to find what I think is that project. Here, it's called the MX4 SIO, but I'm pretty sure it's the same project. It's here on this trizaster.de, it's a German website. It seems like this is a semi-open source project, so if you're a non-commercial user, you can actually come here and order one of these PCBs yourself and the bill of materials and even 3d print your own case and you can make one of these for yourself I'll leave this link in the description it has the link to the Gerbers as well as the bill of materials in the instructions there's even some forum posts about this project on psxplace.com there's actually pretty active discussions the latest post was today or the filming of this video so if you're interested in learning more about the project you can come over here to this forum post and talk to the developers what's a little confusing to me is the name of the project here is actually different than on this trizaster.de site I hope I'm not conflating these two projects so if you know more about the real origins of this project, please let me know in the comments below. Also last week, I talked about a Swiss update that allows you to stream GameCube games over your network. I made mention of the M.2 loader in that video and I accidentally thought that it was the SD2 SB2 adapter. Well, the M.2 loader is actually a different project that allows you to use an M.2 SSD in the serial port on your GameCube. I believe it's being developed by our old pal WebHDX here, and I don't think this project is anywhere near coming out soon, but I did want to clarify that this is a separate project versus the SD2 SB2. I was actually talking to WebHDX in my Discord, kind of about different things for the GameCube. We started talking about IPL mods for the GameCube. I don't know the ton about the differences, but I think that there's two different categories of mod chips for the GameCube. There's IPL mods, and there's also drive chips. So if you have a Xeno GameCube mod, then you have what's known as a drive chip mod. There was another Another kind of mod called an IPL replacement. Versions of that type of mod were the Zoob Cube, I don't know how to pronounce that, the Hyperboot, which I think never really made it to market at all, or the Viper GC. These are pretty old mods. I don't think you can get any of these mods anymore. But what's interesting about these IPL mod chips is I think you would be able to boot into Swiss from an SD card or something without using a disc. Whereas like a Xeno GameCube mod, you would need a disc of Swiss to boot into Swiss. With an IPL replacement, you could boot directly into Swiss without it. So I think with one of those IPL mod chips, if you had an SD to SB2 or one of these M.2 loaders, that might be a better alternative than something like the GC loader. You'd be able to keep your disc drive if you wanted to play disc games, but you'd also be able to load games off of an SD card or an M.2 SSD. This is very interesting to me. We don't really hear a lot about IPL mod chips for the GameCube, at least not publicly available ones. I won't say more than that, but let's hope somebody comes out with an open source IPL mod chip sometime soon. Quick shout out to Robert Dale Smith here. I think he's been working with Fraggle to design this SNES 2 CDI controller adapter. This one looks like you can actually do dual Super Nintendo inputs for the CDI. What's even more interesting is Robert actually has a video of him using the Super Nintendo mouse. I don't really know anything about the CDI. Is it supposed to have a mouse interface? I'm not really sure, but there's footage here of him playing Tetris or something uh, using the Super Nintendo mouse. So I think this is pretty cool. Maybe the accessories for the CDI are kind of rare or expensive, and if that's the case and I think these Mario paint mice are pretty dirt cheap so if it allows people to use cheaper replacement accessories then that's pretty cool. Red Herring posted about a new version of the OpenTendo this time for the NES top loader. OpenTendo if you didn't know is an open source NES replacement motherboard that allows you to completely replace the original components in an NES other than a few components like the PPU and the CPU. I guess it hasn't been released yet but it sounds like this project is coming soon. I think this would be a good excuse for me to revisit my NES top loader. I've kind of noticed when I've been doing testing that the top loader doesn't have as good of output as my front loading NES does. I might have done a poor job with the wiring in the top loader kit when I did my NES RGB in it, but building an open Tendo for the top loader would be a good excuse for me to get back into the top loader and make it kind of kick ass again but all new components in that thing. Last but not least, I wanna talk about this NES RGB issue that Voltar brought up. If you look at the online store that Tim Worthington runs to sell his NES RGB, it mentions that there's a new version, version three. If you look at the NES RGB website, there actually isn't any mention of this newer version. But anyways, Voltar found out that this new version actually removes the multiple palette option from the NES RGB. This new version only has one palette, so you can't swap between multiple palettes like the older versions. This update is because of the semiconductor shortage, which is a real shame, but you know, it's kind of understandable. However, I wish that this was more prominent on the website. I mean, there's no notice of it anywhere here, like NES RGB light 
or anything, you have to come into the description here and read that. So you could very easily buy this version expecting it to have a palette option and not have the palette option. I don't even think the cost is any lower. Not to say that it should be lower, but I think that it's good to warn people that this NES RGB version three is not an improved version. It is a different version that has different features than the normal NES RGB. Anyways, I hope Tim can update his web store with a fairly big warning that says that, hey, this doesn't have that palette switching option. And Voltaire makes a good point in that his NES RGB IGR mod won't work either. That was a mod that allows you to switch palettes using the NES controller. I think it's because the IGR mod solders directly to the vias on the palette option selected part of the NES RGB. Maybe that's why it's not compatible. Anyways, tough times for people who want NES RGBs. Hopefully this can go back to an older, better version sometime soon. That's it for this week. If you want to suggest a new story to me, follow me on Twitter or join the Discord. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.